Agencies Drinking Beer is brought to you by Proposify, software that helps agencies streamline their proposals in the cloud and get faster sign-off. Hello and welcome to the eighth episode of Agencies Drinking Beer, a podcast where we interview an agency owner, learn valuable lessons, and get a buzz on. On this episode, we talk with Scott Galilee about how to systemize your agency sales. Okay, everybody. So we just finished an interview with Scott Gellitly. I said it right. And because he lives in Australia, Kevin and I had to record later in the evening, which is actually, I think, 8 or, okay, 7 o'clock our time is like 8 o'clock next day for Scott in Australia. Mm. And I don't think he was prepared for us at 7 uh, o'clock. He was Well, I, I, he knew his stuff, but you know he did. I, I get come on, give him credit. He started drinking a beer early in the morning. That's for good. us. For I don't us. mean he wasn't prepared. Like his content wasn't good. I mean, he wasn't prepared to deal with our ridiculousness after um, an afternoon of drinking beer. Yeah, waiting. Who, who would be? Uh, you, know, you wake up in the morning, you gotta deal with us. Kind of sucks. Yeah. The, who all those clowns? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> those crazy old Canadians. Canuck. Yeah. yeah, I love Australians though. Mm. They're like our our brethren down under. Yep, straight kind of culty. Hey, you ever call anybody brethren? You're a cult leader. Brethren. No. Who says brethren? Who? I don't know. Cults. I guess. What is a brethren? It's just brother, but it's a creepy way to say brother. Brethren. Brethren or brotherin? Brethren, like a br- 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 I don't know. A brethren minister. A brethren minister. Yeah. A brothel. That's different. Oh. It's like that Simpsons joke. You know, they're like, no S-E-X in front of the C-H-I-L-D-R-E-N. Krusty goes, sex cauldron. I thought they closed that place down years ago. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Okay. All right. So, top three posts of the week. Three really good posts I read this week. I don't know where to start. Where should I start? You don't even know what I'm going to say. No. <sighs> I'm going to talk first about a post from Nathan Barry called Don't Start from Scratch. And what he talks about is often when you think about redesigning something like your website or whatever, everybody kind of, after a few months, you hate what you've got and you're like I want to redesign it I just want to start from the ground up and clients do that too they want you to build a website and they had it rebuilt two years ago but they hate it and they want you to start from the ground up because they hate it and so what he's talking about is you know design good designers redesign which was actually I think a Cameron Mole quote good designers redesign great designers realign which is a fancy way of essentially saying start with what you've got and improve it iteratively over time instead of throwing everything away and starting from scratch because he's what he's saying is if you redesign it you know you're gonna have reached 80 percent before it was declared good enough and everyone moved on to other aspects like running you know whatever your popular popular website but if you improve what you have you can take something that's like 60 70 percent there and actually make it you know 90 100 percent there agree disagree yes. no, i agree No, I disagree. It's more interesting. No, I think it makes sense. All right. Well, you know, not much to talk about there. talks about fixing the little things, and um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, Number two. Number two. Number two I thought was, okay, I'm going to save the really the best for last, but the the one that I thought was really good was, it's a long read. It was on fortune.com by Adam Lashinsky. Um, called Apple's Tim Cook Leads Different. Um, oh, and before that, I okay, never mind. I already said it was Nathan Barry. I thought I didn't mention his name. 
Uh, so this post by Adam Lashinsky about Apple's Tim Cook's Lee's different. So what he's talking about, and it's a long read. I can't really summarize it in a few minutes, but um, he's talking about how Tim Cook had a lot of pressure when he took over leading Apple, and people compared him to Steve Jobs. Oh well, is Apple gonna be this powerhouse of creativity and originality and innovation that Steve Jobs led them to over the course of a decade? He had big shoes to fill, another way of saying it. And it's got some really cool quotes from Tim Cook on what he has done differently and people saying, like, you know, you just kind of took over this billion-dollar, you know, most profitable company ever. Do you really deserve it? Can you do anything? Are you just like an operations guy? And he had this really cool quote. He said, I'm not running for office. I don't need your vote. I have to feel myself doing what's right if I'm the arbiter of that. And... Uh, and he said, I think that's a, a better way to live. So what it actually talked about is when you look at the last few years, was he just riding on the coattail of jobs or was he actually doing anything different? And it breaks down thing, things that Steve Jobs stood for and how Tim Cook is actually his own person. He hasn't just tried to follow some template, right? So like there's five examples. One is that Steve Jobs, he hated the enterprise. He wanted to sell to the consumer market and small businesses and you know he didn't he, he wasn't interested in selling to these bigger IT corporations whereas Tim Cook has emphasized the opportunity to, to sell to enterprise that that could be another channel for them it's all timing though mm -hmm. there's different times I think for, for approaching and I think it may be the timing to do that now because remember Apple I mean we talked about this a while ago I mean they you know, not too long ago, you'd go to a Starbucks and you'd maybe see a couple Apple computers, and then the rest would be Dells, and, and that just flipped around yeah. in the last few years. And, I, and it, so now I think that they've saturated the consumer market in a good way. I think it's just going to spill over, and more people are going to start seeing the value in it mm -hmm. in, at bigger organizations and government. You're already seeing it. You're seeing some governments using it now. Yeah, yeah, well, that's true. Uh, another one was like Steve Jobs. He wasn't into corporate philanthropy. Steve Jobs was not unashamedly you know not into giving money away to help others mm. and Tim Cook has he's done that he's uh, you know trumpeted philanthropy and he's also encouraged giving you know to employees and sharing sharing some of that wealth with them uh, Steve Jobs actually in the same line of thinking opposed dividends and buybacks with shareholders didn't like paying out dividends and Tim Cook has actually you know, accommodated Wall Street when it comes to dividends and buybacks. Another different way he's leading. Again, I mean, I'm not taking sides on anything here, but I mean, you know, Jobs started this thing and was lean for so long that his this guy came in. Don't get me wrong, he's doing a great job, but he came in with all this money. Yeah. So of course, I mean, it, it reminds me of my grandparents. I know it sounds crazy, but they were they were they, they did well. They made some good money, you know, and, and they were very frugal until the day they died because that was what they were used to. So I think a lot of it was frugal and just stingy. Yeah, I mean, that could be because it. it's, it's it was in his DNA. But I mean, Steve Jobs was a billionaire from I like know. since the nineteen eighties. That's true. It wasn't like he was like new money or anything. I know. I know what you're saying though. Yeah. He had to work for it and. Mm. You know, but the thing is, Steve uh, Tim Cook didn't like come into Apple as CEO. Right. He worked for twenty years in Apple mm. before he got to that level. Yeah. Um, well, and uh, on the same line, Steve Jobs loved the limelight. He loved being the center of attention, whereas Steve Jobs or uh, <laughs> Tim Cook shares the limelight with other head managers yeah. at Apple. And also, Steve Jobs didn't like the idea of these big acquisitions buying up companies for billions of dollars and Apple just bought uh, in the last year bought audio company Beats mm. Beats by Dre for three billion dollars wow I heard they bought Proposify too for like 1.2 billion yeah that's pretty cool it was good yeah. Um, yeah okay you know there's a lot more to that article I'm going to link to it but it's definitely worth a read it's interesting mm. and the final one is You're Not Late by Kevin Kelly, and he wrote this on Medium. I think it was from last year. Really good, though. So I'm going to try to paraphrase what he's saying, but he says it a lot 
more succinctly and eloquently than I will. Uh, but essentially what he's saying is, like, imagine you're in 1985 or 1990, and you're thinking, like, imagine what you know now about the internet and where it's going, but you knew that in 1985. What would you do differently? Mm. You'd be like, oh, I'd buy up all these domains. Yep. And I'd start this e-commerce thing, and mm. I'd be the pioneer. Of the, you know, like, oh, yeah. that was the gold rush back then. And now, essentially, like, look around. There's apps for everything. And you're like, where's where can you innovate beyond what they've already done? Like, you can talk into your phone and have it search a worldwide encyclopedia. Mm. Uh, you can do essentially everything that you can think of with the Internet. But what he's saying is that he's like, here's the thing, the other gray beards in 2044, so like, I don't know, I can't do math right now, but say 30 years from now, mm. okay? He's like, can you imagine, they're going to be saying, how, can you imagine how awesome would, it would have been to be an entrepreneur in 2014, mm. 2015? It was a wide open frontier. You know, you could pick almost any category and add some AI to it, put it in the cloud, few devices had more than one or two sensors in them unlike the hundreds now expectations and barriers were low it was easy to be the first and then they would say oh if only re we realized how awesome and how possible everything was back then that's so true so yeah i mean it's it's basically where we have a an amazing we're at an amazing place in the internet it's not it's only 20 years old it's there's a lot of room to innovate and make things better and don't think that everything's been done and anything you do is going to be late to market because it's not. This this has gone on for hundreds of years. Yeah. The mentality. Well, yeah. I mean, imagine... Well, I mean, mm -hmm. I guess the boring example is people 100 and even 100 years ago, if you said, can you go to the moon, let alone send uh, mm -hmm. vessels... Outside of our solar system, they would have said you were crazy. Yep. If you could th put hundreds of people on a passenger jet and fly them around the world, they'd mm -hmm. say you were crazy. You know, it's, it goes on and on. Yep. Essentially, we're not at the end of the road as far as how much you can use the internet to innovate and create things that don't exist and change the way people live. I thought it was a very inspiring article. I like that. I like the topic. Yeah. Always interesting to chat about. Yeah. Uh, so we have a really good interview coming up with Scott Gellity. Gellity. I always do Great this. guy. Good guy and lots of good advice on sales and, you know, creating a system for your agency sales. So let's pass it on to him. All right. I'd like to welcome Scott Gellity from Ballo Empire based in Australia. Where in Australia? Uh, I'm in Br sunny Brisbane, mate. Nice sunny Brisbane. Here. Thank you for joining us, Scott. Hey, mate. Love to be here. Pumped for it. You're our first Aussie. Mate, this is the uh, Agency's Drinking Beer Australian Special. Let it is. <laughs> I like it's, it. It's great to have you. We had our first UK guests last week, so uh, we're, we're going around the world. Mate, you guys are expanding. I love it. It's true. And so you're going to talk to us today about ways that agency owners can, uh, you know, systemize their sales so that it's it's more reliable, knowing what you've got coming in the door, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, as a um, as a self confessed introvert and IT nerd, it's something I absolutely had to do pretty much to get my business uh, cracking. You know what I mean? Yes. So how did maybe get just give us a little bit about your background and, and how you got to this point and what your company is up to? Yeah, sure. So um, I, I guess uh, as a project manager in the mining construction industry, I um, no, my background is that uh, I felt like the IT industry and people that were trying to uh, service small businesses, whether it's agencies or other consultancies, really had this kind of um, uh, that they were selling features. They weren't really selling benefits and outcomes for small businesses, and I thought that it could be done better. Um, so I started up Bolo Empire um, really to help agencies and consultancies um, go from that freelancer who's struggling to 
expand to scale up and, and really do what they need to do um, to becoming an actually fully fledged business and really achieving their dreams and wants. Um, and you know, as an IT guy myself, I you know, and a natural introvert, um, I struggle to start with with selling. You know, I'm not naturally, I'm not that classic natural sales guy. You know what I mean? Yes. You're not. You're not the extrovert. Hmm. Yeah. Not the guy that comes into a room and owns the room and you know knows how to um, to talk to people. So I had to sort of take my own approach to it. Um, but um, through systemizing my sales, I've actually started to you know start converting like a demon because it's a, a process, a consistent process that I can execute each time. And that's what what I could uh, what I can talk about today. Okay, Scott. So. Tell me about this idea of you know turning your sales into a system because I know a lot of agency owners and we were kind of we were the same way back in the day. I mean you know you can only the new leads and new sales kind of come with the seasons. You can't really control it and there's not a whole lot you can do about it. Most people rely on referrals and you know they go through these long spells where there's nobody calling and then other periods where they're too busy. So like how do you if you're an agency owner, how do you turn that into a system that's predictable and reliable? Yeah, well, I mean, predictable and reliable is, is certainly one thing, but um, you know, as entrepreneurs and as business owners, we've got to also leverage ourselves, leverage ourselves 100%. You know, every 15 minutes counts to contribute, you know, contributing to the hustle, if you like. Um, so you've got to turn what is really probably the biggest cost of sales element in your business um, and drop it back down to something that's affordable. So, you know, obviously it looks good in the P&L, but also enabling you to, to scale up and um, and make more sales at the same time. Does that yeah, make sense? What, what have you seen in, in companies you've worked with, especially like service agencies, what have you seen be the, the biggest cost of sale that's uh, people are spending too much money on and aren't doing anything for them? Uh, well, again, that sales process, that element of, yeah, I'm just going to go out there. I'm going to make um, have plenty of conversations, spend a heap of time on uh, yeah, understanding what features they want, um, spend eight hours producing a proposal um, for you know a two or three thousand dollar job. And when you look back on that and actually assess, well, how much time was spent on sales? Um, how many conversions did I get? What is my conversion rate compared to um, what you're actually charging out? You know, a lot of um, particularly early stage agencies and, and freelancers and consultants get a rude shock, and that's when you know, and that can start to lead to a, a downward spiral, um, where you, as you said, you're constantly you're sort of hunting for the work, you get the work, you execute, and in that period that you're executing, you weren't chasing the work, so now you're back to the beginning again, and you're back having to hunt, and you're spending all this time on sales. Um, and for people that, um, you know, maybe that when they first said, you know what, I'm not working for the man anymore, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go do my own thing and become a freelancer, they might have had excellent technical skills. They might be great designers, great web developers, great consultants in, in their chosen field. But sales doesn't come to everybody naturally. Right. Right. And to be honest, even for those that it does come naturally, they can still benefit highly from really turning into a system. And when I say into a system, I talk about um, two things, really. First of all, what used to be called relationship selling, I actually think that there's another level to that, and that's really understanding your customer's true why. And I'll, I'll break that down a bit more in a minute. But then once you understand that, turning those set of steps that you know converts and that you know works um, into a process that's consistent with a you know a software platform that captures all that um, data and makes sure that you're held accountable and, and kept consistent um, and then again leveraging a team for instance say a virtual assistant um, to take all those other little bits and pieces like you know producing your proposify proposal um, and all of that sort of stuff out of a template and doing that for you so that as the business owner, you're ultimately leveraged. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, that that presents a very interesting idea, just the last thing that you said about proposals, right? 
um, because you're kind of saying turn it into a system so that essentially you can hire that, you can delegate that to somebody else. Um, but in your experience consulting agencies and whatnot, have you have you noticed a difference in close rate between, say, founders or the business owner who write who takes those t- eight hours and writes a proposal from scratch? Or have you seen the same close rate even if people kind of treat the proposal as somewhat a template that you can just slam out and not spend a whole lot of time on? Well, it's a um, great question. It actually comes down to that first bit, the understanding of the why, because that's actually where the work is. Um, you know, turning it into something generic, um, if it actually still addresses that true why, your conversion rate will go through the roof. I mean, I can attest that my sales process used to take sort of 12 to 18 hours uh, and I converted about 20%. And now it takes four hours and I converted 80%. You know, I convert like a demon. What do you attribute to that? Treating it like a standardized process. But, um, you know, again, first of all, we talk about that understanding the true why. Um, A lot of people, you know, they sell benefits or they sell features I should say you know my system or my design skills do this this and this Um, my experience enables me to do this this and this it's got absolutely nothing to do with you and everything to do with the person you're talking to yeah so I see that a lot in freelancers I see a lot of people who are selling features who are selling themselves and not selling to the customers true why and then you're eight, once you know how to do that, you can turn it into a process. But let me just elaborate on that. So, you know, for me personally, there's three levels of why. I've really spent a lot of time um, trying to understand who my customers are. So they come to me and I know that, I know instinctively that they want more control of their business. They want more visibility. They're designers and, and web, you know, web developers who have scored a heap of work through referrals and things like that, but are struggling to keep up with the demand who have, you know, to put it bluntly, shit's flying everywhere, right? So they need that part addressed. That's usually the first reason they seek out help. But the reality is that's not actually what they want or why they want it. What they're actually trying to achieve is a scalable business or a growing business or a business that generates income to let them live. That's the second level. What they may not even understand and that you've got to educate them through your sales process is their true why, which is actually to be successful, to live the life that they want, you know, whether it's family or travel or, or whatever, but to build a successful business and ultimately an asset they can sell. And it doesn't matter if you're doing systems like I am, if you're an agency producing a a website or graphic design or app development or whatever, it doesn't matter what your service is. Ultimately, you're contributing to that higher vision. You're contributing to them being able to build an asset that can work for them, that enables them to live the life they want to live, that set of steps that I outlined before, you know, going from what are their early, you know, what are their frustrations and their pain points and their their wants to understanding what their true needs and fears are Um, and then establishing your CRM system or your sales system to um, go through, you know, establish that scenario and then address your solution against that scenario, against those pain points and how it, you know, it achieves that for them. So what are the outcomes and then addressing how it's going to make them feel. You can, I mean, to give you a, um, I wouldn't say a trivial use case, but um, if you t- told a cancer patient that you could save them, they're not going to say no. They're compelled to say yes. They're compelled to take your value proposition and say, this is what I want for myself and for my business. I, yeah, like I, I think that um, part of the challenge involved is that when you're out selling agency services, which is usually out at events or trade shows or in pitch meetings, like, you know, there's certain lead gen um, kind of scenarios, you know, being able to talk to people and really understand those 
that deep level of why about how you're going to make their life easier. I mean, um, most people just go, don't go down to that level when they're out selling. I, I do understand what you're saying, and I, I, I believe the same thing initially. But now after closing, you know, X hundreds of, of jobs, I can see the pattern. And this is, again, where your system comes into place. Because if you're capturing this information as you do talk to people, you're understanding the pattern. And systems are all about patterns, all about replicating the same thing over and over again. And you'll find that there is a small set of frustrations and wants that they all want. There is a small set of those level two and deeper why things that everybody wants. It's actually everybody's the same. We're not all that much different from one another. But what it might do is just change slightly based on the type of product you're selling um, or the type of customer. So if you deal with middle management, right, you're not talking about scaling up a business. You're talking about them covering their ass and looking good in front of their boss. Mm. That's ultimately what they're trying to achieve. That's a you great can point. Sell to them, you, know? you can sell to that. You can sell to that in your um, EDMs. You can sell to that if your trade shows and all of your um, marketing paraphernalia, if you like. You can sell that in your customer testimonials that you put up on your website or, or whatever. We cover our clients' asses. We cover our clients' asses. <laughs> uh -huh. All you middle managers out there. Yep, that's right. If your target market is middle managers, they're going to come to you. And you know, at the end of the day, that, that's why as a small operator, when you're trying to verse, you know, we'll call them the big guys, the big guys often win even though they're astronomically more expensive because at the end of the day, a middle manager will go, if I pick this big guy and he fails, it's not on my shoulders because at the end of the day, he's the big guy. He was expected to have won. Everyone expects that I would choose the big guy um, if they fuck it up. Excuse me. If they stuff it up, it's all right. It's their fault. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Whereas, yeah. You, you, you know what I'm saying, guys? Like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. If you can actually sell to that true why, it doesn't really matter who it is. And because there's those patterns there, you can systemize it. So your sales system, if when you know who your customer is, your sales system, whether it's a sales call that you have, you know, a lot of people will have a, a lead qualification process which, you know, extracts the people who aren't interested from those that are really are keen. And you might have some qualifying questions which just dig to that second level to establish if they're interested. Um, then you might have your overall sales process, which really goes to the third level, addresses how your solution achieves the outcomes and you know, will make them feel that way. Um, and then include, you know, well, this is how I pre-frame my costings. Um, this is how I determine if I've got authority to proceed. Um, if the timeline's right, you know, your standard BANT style questions can all be included in that process, in that set of steps so that you do it consistently every time. The stuff that comes naturally to those sales guys who can just go out and talk, for us introverts, we've got to have it in a system. Um, and then it's consistent every time, right? So you have lead qual, you have discovery call, you have sales presentation, right? Let's say that's your steps. You do that the same every time. And anyone that's outside of that, you can actually disregard because there's plenty of work out there for everybody. You need to keep your cost of sales to a certain amount. You know that this is a way that closes. Anyone that wants you to jump through hoops that you just don't think is necessary, say thank you very much. There's someone else out there to jump through those hoops. Hmm. You know, when I hear you talk, talk about um, introverts, I identify with that because I am an introvert. Kevin doesn't believe it, no, but I not. am. Yeah, I am. I have to. I have to have beer to get through this podcast. No, you don't. But Kevin, I will say, is an extrovert. We've both done the Myers Briggs personality test, and Kevin is an extrovert. I'm an introvert. Kevin is the kind of guy who will like. This is why he was really good partner to have running an agency. Was that he's the guy who will like go out on Saturday night to the pub and sit at you know sit at the counter and just strike a conversation with somebody next to him who happens to be you know, this like president of a big company who's like, oh, I need your services, you know, and you always like having that guy because that's not me. I'm good once like a lead's in the door and I can explain what we do. I'm, I like those kind of sales, but the whole lead gen thing, you need an, extra, an extrovert for that. 
there's a difference between personal extroverts and other types of extroverts because you're ex- like on this podcast you, you're shining this is your thing man edit that out I <laughs> see that makes me uncomfortable but let's not talk about ourselves like so <laughs> we're we're trying to use this as an example for other agency owners right a lot you either have the extrovert who's like out there loves you know kissing babies and all that stuff and then you've got the introverts like Will your will that system that idea of systemizing your business does that work on both extroverts and introverts or do you need to kind of treat it differently? No, absolutely, and you've actually answered the question in the, in the dialogue you've just had. So, Kevin, you said you know Kyle's shining right now because he's in his comfortable place. Um, if you make the system your comfortable place, you can still bring out all the things that you need. So, if I sit down at the pub and this you know a potential prospect who's having a beer next to me um, i know that the set of steps i've got to go through to get him interested because i've turned it into a system i i know that if i um open with some statements around xyz talk about uh, because i know my customer so well right i ask questions like a doctor you know and like a business analyst i ask the right questions and i know what that set of steps is I actually direct the conversation in the in the way that I want. And as an introvert, as a systems dude, as an engineer, um, you know, I love directing things in the way that um, in the design that I want. And it might come across that I'm extroverted because I know my shit, right? But the reality is that I'm just going through a set of steps in my own mind. Hmm. So that anyone, extrovert, introvert, it doesn't matter. Um, and ext- at the end of the day, an introvert probably just gets drained, more drained talking to an extroverted person. At the end of the day, they can still be, they can still have the appearance of an outgoing person. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, that's... Said that before. Yeah, no, I mean, there was a great uh, TED Talk. Uh, I can't remember the name of the... A woman who put that on, but <clears throat> she talked about it. she's an int- introvert and how it's not what you think about, like somebody just being shy. That's not being an introvert. It's the fact that being outgoing, you enjoy doing it, but for a very short amount of time, and then it drains the energy from you. Whereas an extrovert actually gains energy by being in front of people and strangers. And and you can't be if you're just an engineer or a designer, and you, all you want to do is just sit behind a computer and do your craft. Don't be a, a business owner. Yeah, exactly right. Exactly right, Kyle. And, and at the end of the day, let, let's tie this back into what we're talking about around systemizing your sales, right? Again, what it really comes down to is turning that technician into somebody, to, complementing that technician's skill with the ability to sell. And when they can sell cost effectively uh, and with a high conversion rate, they can start bringing in more work for less, which means they can start bringing on people, which means they can start scaling, which means they can start achieving their true want, which is building an asset. You're doing the same thing for yourself in systemizing your scales. You see how this connects? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there are other things, because as I mentioned at the very start, you know, it's all about leveraging yourself as a business owner. And this is where once that, that high level system's in place that's enabling you to convert, then there's a stack of tricks that you can start to throw in there to really leverage Ooh, yourself. Tell us some of those tricks. All righty. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll give you a good example of how um, I do proposals. Okay. okay. So in my CRM, um, I use a product called Podio, which allows me to customize my CRM and put any fields that I want in and task my virtual assistant who's a low cost center resource to do things on my behalf. So you set up your system, you, you know, which is effectively your platform, your CRM platform for sales, to have things like what sections of a proposal you want. I'm a, I mean, I'm a lover of Proposify um, and oh, it's got all this. Don't if fly out of us. Have you guys heard of Proposify? Have you used it before? It's good, huh? Uh, yeah. I heard the owners are douchebags, but other than that, I heard the product is good. Yeah, well, we won't talk about those clowns, but the product is, <laughs> is awesome, especially after this zero introduction that's come on. I've got my, my Proposify templates set up with the sections that I want, 
and I've highlighted areas where you can just punch in the, um, the snippets or the, the sections that you can add. And then in my CRM, I've got them listed out as categories, as tick boxes. So I go through my sales process. I understand who my customer is because I do some behavioral analysis and I can you know, talk about that later. Um, I understand what their, um, their true why is. So what are the outcomes and the feelings they're trying to achieve? And then from that, I derive what the features are and I tick them off in my CRM. Mm -hmm. And then when it reaches a certain stage in my CRM, <coughs> quote stage or whatever, it sends a task to my VA, go produce a proposal using all of this information. They go and do the proposal for you based on a template. They filled in all of the information from your system. It actually still addresses the true why because even though it's from a template, it's just taken, you know, there's a section that's taken from your CRM. All I have to do is get in, plug in a price and hit send. Boom, yeah. 12 hour, eight hour proposal process down to 15 minutes. Yeah, yeah. Plus maybe a, a $20 fee from my VA. Right, right. Ultimate leverage. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I mean, what you just said is exactly, I think what we've always agreed is like the, the way to go and it's just a, a matter of how you get there and how you figure out, you know, your target audience. And I think that's a problem with a lot of agency owners. I know I sound like a broken record. We say this almost every week, but like people just, sometimes you just don't know who you're selling to. Like when I think about some of our clients that were heads of government departments that we were pitching doing websites for, you, I wouldn't have been able to understand them at the level that I would maybe understand other entrepreneurs. Because when you talked about understanding your audience, you're talking about you know, living a more simple life and you do, doing what you love and all these things that are very closely associated with being an entrepreneur. But then when you talked about middle management, you talked about covering your ass and all that kind of stuff. So like, I think that's just the problem is like for the, the odd agency owner and for, for most of them, I would think every person they pitch to is different because they don't have a target in mind. They're just going after anybody who needs their services. Spot on, spot on. And, and that's where, you know, to take systemization to a deeper level, you've got to productize your service. You've got to lock in the particular I'm not going to say market vertical, but I'm going to say the particular market profile that you want to sell to. And maybe you've got two or three profiles that you sell to within a particular vertical um, or particular area. But, but um, Like I would think having too many personas would be better than having none. Um, honestly, one is good. Ten, ten is not so good unless you've got the resources in your business to handle it. If you're just starting out, you're the freelancer or you're the small agency, really, you want a very small number of profiles, one or two, because you know that you can sell to them. You know them better than they know themselves. You know what they have for breakfast. You can turn your sales process, because you know that, you can turn it into a system that hits those things every time that you know will make them want to, to have your system irrespective of the cost. Yeah. And then there's all the other tricks like, you know, the proposal thing I talked about, um, you know, to, to in, you know, decrease the amount of time it takes to create a proposal and even other little things, you know, like I don't send emails to my clients in the early stages. My VA does that. Mm. I task my VA at different stages in my sales process to um, mm. send different email templates um, just, you know, with slight variations based on the data that's in my CRM. Um, there's a ton of things that you can do to leverage your time. So you've got understanding the true why, which has got to be the first step. No matter what you do, whether you systemize or not, that is the absolute must-have. Um, turning things into a, a system so that you can apply that every time uh, and then looking at all the little ways of leveraging yourself so you don't have to do low value activities. Do you ever see people who are, uh, you know, you, you, we want to turn the sales into a process, but sometimes people who aren't, they, they're interested in being a client of yours and they want you to maybe talk about a project or something, but they're just what we call tire kickers and they keep emailing you and they, you know, you'll have a meeting with them or I sit down for a coffee and they're like, 
you know, you want the next step to be a proposal, but they're sort of like, well, you know, you got to wait for a few months until we get the funding in the door. Do you ever have uh, any ways to deal with tire kickers, people who just waste your time for years having coffees and lunches and never actually turn into clients? Excellent question. And another thing that you've got to have sorted out if you're going to um, reduce that cost of sales, you know. Um, first of all, you've got to understand the buying cycle. People go through a stage of awareness, so they know that there's a problem, that they need something done. Then they'll go through a stage of research, which is well, what's on the market, what's out there that can solve my problem. Then they'll start looking at actually purchasing. There's a stack of different models out there, right? But that's the simple way of, of putting it. Um, you've got to identify through those questions, through that system of when people are in what stage. And that's why I, I recommend that every agency have a lead qualification process prior to their overall sales process. So that is some qualifying criteria that identify, you know, that they can ask, which will identify where they're at and also hit those key why things. Because at the end of the day, if they are in purchase mode and you present to them their true why, they're not going to stuff around for 12 months. Mm. If you can tell them that you're going to solve all of their pain and you're going to enable them to scale their business up and create an asset and sit on a banana land sipping pina coladas, they ain't, they're not going to sit around waiting for it, right? Yeah. For our, at the end of the day, everybody's got money. It's just what they their priorities are what they want to spend it on. That's mm. true. Everybody's got money, or we wouldn't be eating. Yeah. Um, they would have a business if they didn't have money. They've just chosen to spend it on other things. So you've got to get yourself bumped up the priority list. And if you address the true why, their true why, and you might have to educate them. And that's what I mean. If you find somebody who's in the early stages, in the awareness stage, you have to educate them. Don't go out to coffee with them every time. That's wasting your time. You've got to have that initial conversation, educate them on what the, the process is as far as what it could achieve for their business, put them on a um, mailing campaign, or get them on your social media, onto your blogs and things like that where your content is educating them on the process. Mm. And in any conversation that you do have, always end with an action. Never leave with, yeah, let's catch up again in a few months, yeah. ever. Always end. I mean, you know, Kevin, you know this for sure, you know, from your BDM history. You've got to have, okay, that's great. You need time to think about it. Let's talk again in one week about how we can help you achieve this, this, and this. Same way. Yep. You know? And yep. then if in one week's time you speak to them, they go, oh, look, we're still not sure. Okay, that's cool. Let's have another call. Let's not have a coffee. Let's have a call, a 15-minute call in three months' time. Mm. And again, you're hitting them with content in that period to bring their mindset up. 15-minute call run through your qualification process. Mm. Sometimes we see in, now. I mean, we knew it for ourselves when we ran the agency, but we see it sometimes uh, within Proposify even when we're helping out customers who want us to go into their account, right? We'll see these proposals sitting in their queue that have been sent 130 days ago, and they haven't been won, they haven't been declined. And so I know it's not just us. It's it's you know you get your lead to the proposal stage and you 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 send them your proposal maybe you talk through it on the phone and then they say okay we need some time to make a decision and then it just goes cold you don't hear from them you email you don't hear back and you're like you know sometimes that sits in your sales pipeline for six months and you're like is this are they going to move ahead or aren't they that was the story of my life when I first started that you know and I think it's probably the story of everyone. oh yeah. It's an agency and consultant when they first started. There's two ways that I've tackled that. Um, first of all, the lead qualification process, they don't even get to proposal stage mm. until I'm confident that they're in the buying cycle, they're in the buying position, you know, they're ready to purchase because they're throffing at the mouth for what I've got to give them. Yeah. Secondly, I never ever just send a proposal. I book a meeting, a presentation, and I send the proposal five minutes prior to that. Uh, 
And then in that presentation, I literally walk through that proposal and that proposal actually walks through your system, your true why, the scenario, the dreams, the wants, the fears, the frustrations, the true dreams and fears. It walks through that process. It then addresses your solution and the outcomes it's going to achieve. And then maybe timeline and, you know, why bother empire and, or, you know, whatever. Um, and then at that point, you say, have I addressed you know, this, this, and this, is this what you want to get your business to the next level or address the true why? Yes, it is. This is what I want. Great. This is what you've got to invest in your business to make it happen. Mm. And give them an option for upfront payment or some kind of cash flow management payment over time model. They can't say no to that. Yeah. So make, make it happen get you, or map, you, map it to your cash flow. And you will get to achieve your true why. Wow! Talk more about that. You talked. You just talked about uh, sort of closing the deal and and giving them some payment options. So, what's worked and what hasn't, like in your experience? Yeah, great, great question. This is, you know, no matter how good you get your sales process, a lot of people have an innate ability to ask, or, or inability, I should say, to ask for money for what they do. That's actually like a, a mental block. Um, and again, a system can address that by running you through a set of steps so that you do it every time. That's how I do it. Um, so you get to the point where you've addressed their true why, and then you have to transition from that to the investment. And you've got to ask the question, how would this solution make you feel? If the answer, if they're nodding, said this would make me feel great, this would make me achieve dreams and wants, and you say, cool, here's what the investment, you know, here's the investment in your business to make it happen. You know, how can you say no? Short of putting a million dollars on what should be a thousand dollar process, uh, or being, you know, totally out of the ballpark, um, dollar wise, yeah, they are compelled to say yes. And if, if the dollars is a problem, again, you offer two options and really you should have pre-framed this back in that sales process. Do they want to, you know, our solutions, you know, some of our customers or most of our customers like to spend roughly this much money with us. Um, do you think that's something you would like to just pay up front and get done? Or is it something you'd rather spread out over a payment plan of six months? And they'll say, oh, look, you know, money's a bit of a problem. I'd rather do it over six months. You already know that your sales process then when it comes to you know you're calling it the close but it's really the open um of the the project um you're using your proposal as a sales presentation so you know f powerpoint presentations they're just a waste of time proposal fire is beautiful and it looks just as good as any sales presentation so you run through that you you understand it true why you get to them and say you know is this gun how will this make you feel is this what is going to achieve your true why? Yes, it is. Great. Yeah. yeah exactly. We already know what's over a period of time. And if it, kind of what you touched on earlier is that if they, if the client's surprised when you show them the price, then you did something wrong early on because they shouldn't be surprised when they see the price. They shouldn't be surprised. No. They, should, they should have an innate knowledge of, of what, you know, you should have pre-framed that earlier. And, and the best is, this is just, you know, just for us inside salespeople. If you get a big intake of breath, oh, okay, good. You've nailed it. You've actually, you've perfectly valued your service. If you get an immediate yes, you've left money on the table. Ah. ah. So, yeah, you, you the perfect point. I think this goes for any business, agency or otherwise, but, like, if you can charge – if people don't like your charging or or what you're charging, but they pay it anyway, then it's priced perfectly. <laughs> yeah. If they, if they're like, yeah, sure. I'll move ahead with that. Then obviously, yeah, they were expecting a lot more. They were expecting a lot more and they could have paid a lot more. Um, and, and, and those that do take the intake of breath and go, okay, this is what I really want. You're also going to find they're a better client. Because yeah, yeah. they're committed on an emotional level, and they've put 
you know, their nuts on a block yeah, so it's, yeah. to, to make it happen because it's a significant financial investment for them. That's true. It's not just a little, you know, like we spend money at the at the store on just little impulse items. You wouldn't want your agency's service to be an impulse buy. And, and this is a huge problem that's happened in the web development industry over the past however many years. It's been a race to the bottom on price yeah, up yeah. until quite exactly. recently. Now there's no value associated with a website. People sell on the features, which at the end of the day, a uni student can produce a feature. Um, and they re and and it's just a price war. They'll go to the next poor little agency freelancer who's doing websites and say, "Hey, this guy said do it for eight hundred. Can you do it for for seven fifty? Yeah, sure, I'll take it." Yeah, you know, if you get into that trap, man, you're not just doing yourself a disservice. You're actually doing your entire industry a disservice. Bang on. Yeah, Kevin's agreeing. Oh yeah. <laughs> We've seen we saw that locally too, you know, like just uh, people. It's easy to say, like, well, you know, you'll get better quality by paying a, an agency that charges more. But the, unfortunately, that's not always the case, is it? Like sometimes people are like, "That's a really good site." Oh, well, I paid you know a freelancer, you know, five hundred dollars to rip off a WordPress template, and the agency's site sometimes, unfortunately, looks like garbage compared to it. So it's not always like just quality oh well you know you'll get more if you pay more it should be it also has to be in integrated with the whole um strategy yeah totally you know it, it that's the bottom line and that is you, you're spot on kevin that is the bottom line it's yeah. got to be part of a broader strategy whether they know it or not and it's got to address the true why mm -hmm. if otherwise i mean you, you look at my own so site book shameless plug follow empire.com.au um oh we're happily plugging you man <laughs> everyone looks at my site and goes man that looks pretty slick for a you know because of the same thing you know most agencies and most consultants actually have the shittiest websites yeah. and, and and they look at that and go man this is really good it's just a wordpress site with a divi theme yeah Put it, brought the thing yeah. up in in a week and then iterated on it a few times Producing a nice looking website isn't hard today, but all the add on stuff like having a proper strategy, integrating it with some good graphic design, positioning everything on your website to tell the story that I just talked about before. You know, there's a heap of stuff that can really go into web design to make it convert local search um, expertise and SEO and all that sort of stuff. Uh, a web designer has to look beyond just punching out WordPress sites because they'll go broke. So what's next for Bolo Empire? Where are you taking this? Well, uh, great question. It's um, We're looking at sort of 20% uh, growth month on month over the past six months. I mean, we're still a fairly new agency, but um, you know we've closed in the last three months uh, more than we closed most of last year. And awesome. uh, so the growth is, is really starting to kick along. And, and I attribute that to knowing my, my customer at a, at a deep level and having my processes in place. Um, we've systemized the business now so that we have a, a low cost center of delivery. And um, so now it's about extracting me out of the business. And, um, you know, when I talk about what's next for Volo Empire, I'm really talking about what's next for me because that's what it's all about. And um, so I talk about extracting myself from the business um, and bringing on um, salespeople to run it against my processes, and thus it becomes ultimately scalable. We want to become the number one because there is only one. There is only room for number one. Well, I'm not in a big country, uh, population-wise. We're going to be. Yeah. Well, at the end of the day, number one gets ninety percent of the market, and the rest have to feed off the ten. Right. So you've got to pick exactly your specific market and become number one in that. And that's the mindset. Um, you know, Polo Empire's four core values are no bullshit, simple and elegant, stay humble, but be number one. Mm. And that's what we're seeking to be. So over the next 12 months, we want a million dollar business. Um, and in the next few years, we want a $5 million business. So we've got a roadmap in place. Um, we know what we're trying to do. We know our segment. 
Um, and ultimately for me, it's to build an asset that um, I can sell so I can start working on the other projects that I've got um, in mind. So Awesome. Well, well, best of luck with your business and thank you for your time sharing all your great tips and suggestions with us. Hey, yeah. No worries, guys. Really enjoyed it. Thank, thank you. you. Definitely. And uh, I might, now that I've started drinking my beer, I think I might just... Um, finish my day off and take it off and have a chill. <laughs> that sounds like a great idea. Can I just plug my Australian fav- my favourite Australian beer? Of course. James Bogues, Tasmania's finest. Brewed in the uh, cool, streaming highland waters of Tasmania into a bottle to your mouth. You should charge them a, a royalty, man. I wish I, could, I I want one right now. <laughs> you did a good job. You sold me. We'll link to that in the show notes. <laughs> yeah, we should. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Scott. Yeah, thank you. Have a good day, man. You too. Take care. Cheers. That was a good interview. Very good interview. I say that every week, but I mean it. I mean it every week. We've had great guests. I know. Really great guests. They've yeah, they've reached out, and it's it's great. We're getting this kind of quality. Not just the quality. The quality is great, but they're also their enthusiasm. They love it. Mm -hmm. They love being interviewed and talking and helping people. Yeah. People like to share their their gifts, their knowledge. It's always good. Uh, so tomorrow at the time of this interview, you'll be hearing it later, but uh, it's actually Good Friday, so we will uh, we'll be off tomorrow. The team's off, and you're going to enjoy your weekend? Mm. Actually, yeah, I have a lot to do. I mean, think about all the snow, and hopefully some of that's melting. The in-laws are away. i got to go dig them out before they get home. Ah. Yeah, but yeah, it'll be good. Yeah, hang out. Yeah. What about you? Uh just doing Easter stuff with kids. Oh, that's right. It's Easter. Looking for chocolate eggs and whatnot. Yeah. Cool. It'll be fun. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I want to tell a joke this week. I like it. I'm going to lead us out with a joke. Okay. I read this, and I thought it was pretty funny. It's a little dark, but it's funny. An old man is lying on his deathbed with his children, grandchildren, and older great-grandchildren all around teary-eyed at the approaching finale of a very long and productive life. The old man is in a terminal coma, and the doctors have confirmed that the waiting will be over within the next 24 hours. Suddenly, the old man opens his eyes and croaks, I must be dreaming of heaven. I smell your grandmother's strudel. No, grandfather, you're not dreaming. Grandmother's baking strudel now. I know I'll never have another chance to taste her delicious strudel after this one. Uh, Could you please go down and get me a piece? The old man begs with what is left of his final breath. One of the grandchildren is immediately dispatched to honor the old man's last requests. After a long time, he returns empty-handed. Did you bring me one of... Did you bring me one last piece of your grandmother's delicious strudel? The old man plaintively queries. I'm very sorry, Grandfather, but she says it's for the funeral. <laughs> what? That's good. It is good. It's just like, you old man. Yeah. You're not getting this shit. Yep. No, it's good. I like it. No it's laugh? Good. Nothing? I'm laughing inside. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good. I'm swearing now just to... It's a lot better than mine. That's all I can say. Ah. Uh... So then again, some of the Rodney stuff's pretty funny. I giggled, man. It took a little longer to get to the punchline, but I thought it was a, a yeah, whatever. It was good. I think our our, our viewers are gonna love it. That's good. I'm swearing now, just I'll have to believe just those to spite out. you. I'll have to believe those goddamn things out. All right. Well, let us know in the comments who you think whose jokes you like better, Kevin's or mine. <laughs> I hope they pick me. Uh, I think that's it for now. That's it. Have a good weekend, everyone. Enjoy. All right.